So today we're going to talk about classifying matter, okay? So before we begin, um, I want to review just a few of the things from the last video. Democritus and Aristotle. Democritus thought that stuff was made out of atoms and that they're little mini versions of the whole. And Aristotle thought that stuff was a com made of combinations of five elements, earth, water, air, fire, and something called ether. Now, both of these uh, philosophers from 2,000 years ago were sort of right, but also sort of wrong. Okay, today's modern understanding of what stuff is made out of um, has pieces of both of these uh, in them. For example, uh, we do believe that things is made out of elements, like Aristotle did, combinations of these elements, which is what I'm going to talk about today, but it's not those five elements. In fact, earth, water, air, fire, and ether are no longer considered elements at all, um, but other things. Now, Democritus thought stuff was made out of atoms, but he thought there were an infinite number of atoms and every material was made of its own version of those atoms. Um, that's not entirely wrong, but you can have some atoms combined together to make new atoms, and when you get down to the smallest atoms that can kind of be broken apart, that's what we call an element. So basically our, our modern understanding now is both of these ideas with some of the stuff kind of taken out there. The five elements, gone, but the idea of elements is still there. The infinite number of atoms, many versions of the whole thing, that's gone, but things are made out of discrete bits called atoms. Okay. Now, alchemists in the Middle Ages started to discover this idea that both of them might be right. Things are made out of atoms, but also there are specific atoms that combine to make other things. And so as they were discovering things about new materials, they started trying to figure out what these elements were. Um, you can still see on this chart, this is an alchemist chart of elements, that they have fire, water, air, and earth still. They also have a few things like Mercury and Venus and Mars. The idea of ether kind of developed into different elements for the different planets. But they are starting to discover certain things that are actually elements. For example, copper and lead and arsenic and phosphorus. There are a few things that aren't actually elements, like salt and vinegar. Those aren't actually elements, but um, we were kind of headed in the right track here. Most chemists believed fire was due to some fiery principle that was given up during combustion. And all our senses seem to confirm this idea. Heat, light, smoke, all are released as the fire burns. By the mid-1700s, this essence of fire had been given a name, phlogiston. Phlogiston was the foundation of chemistry's leading theory for nearly a century because it seemed to explain things like metals and rust. When iron ore was heated in the presence of charcoal, phlogiston from the charcoal fused with the ore to form metallic iron. When the iron was exposed to air or water, the metal released its phlogiston as it rusted. Other metals went through the same process, forming the green verdigris of copper, for example. Ore plus phlogiston equals metal. Metal minus phlogiston equals rust, or what was then called a calx. Only there was a problem. The calx was heavier than the metal, even though phlogiston had left the metal. It's lost something, and yet it was heavier. The cox should weigh less than the original metal, but it doesn't. The cox is heavier than the metal. Though many chemists were aware of this contradiction, they let it pass because phlogiston otherwise worked so well. But Lavoisier was really troubled by this because he was obsessed with the weights of his experimental ingredients. Lavoisier was very careful to get very good instruments. He probably at one point had the largest and most complete private laboratory on Earth. With my precision scales imported from England at great expense, I measured the weight of each substance at the beginning and end of every chemical reaction. Lavoisier was a master of this balance sheet kind of chemistry. Remember, he was a tax administrator by day. He knew a lot about accounting, and so this kind of ledger keeping was natural to him. It is a fundamental truth of chemistry that the same amount of matter exists before and after each experiment. 
Nothing new is created, nothing lost. The whole art of performing chemical experiments rests on this principle. Today we call this idea the conservation of matter. When you carry out a chemical reaction, what comes out has to be exactly equal to what goes in. The total weight must remain precisely the same. If not, there's an error somewhere. He wasn't the first to assume conservation of matter, but Lavoisier applied this idea more rigorously than anyone had before. And it worked very effectively as a tool, a tool of discovery. The power of Lavoisier's method would become clear in October 1772, when he set out to solve the riddle of why metals gain weight when they form calxes. Common sense suggested that when things rust, they must lose weight, they fall apart, they become brittle and weak. Lavoisier was interested in actually measuring what happened. He conducted his experiments in public, relying on a huge burning lens that focused the sun's rays to produce intense heat while elegantly dressed bystanders watched in amazement. Lavoisier placed a calx of lead mixed with charcoal inside a glass vessel partially filled with water, then subjected it to the intense heat of the burning lens. The result was extraordinary. As the calx changes back into the metal, it releases a large quantity of air. This air forms a volume a thousand times greater than the calx it came from. This startling finding suggested a radical idea. If air came out as the calx changed back into a metal, could it have gone in when the calx was formed? Could air be the reason calxes were heavier than expected? Lavoisier also found that when he burned elements like sulfur, they too gained weight. There was then no doubt. I realized that the increase in weight occurs because a portion of the air is absorbed into the solid material. He knew he was onto something very important. He knew that the element did not lose mass, it gained mass. It took up some part of the air. So Antoine Lavoisier, he is an alchemist who is considered the father of modern chemistry. He's the point where we went from alchemy to chemistry. The reason why is because he insisted on very, very careful measurements and evidence to support his ideas. Okay, now he is responsible for a whole bunch of things, but some of the most important ones is that he came up with what's called the Law of Conservation of Mass. Uh, he helped construct the metric system, which we've been using over the last couple of weeks, um, and which is now used around the world. He also disproved the alchemist idea of phlogiston, which was an element they believed existed, um, in favor of something in the air, which he named oxygen. Okay. Studying the oxygen, oxygen was actually discovered by Joseph Priestley. He was actually able to disprove Aristotle's five elements. So it's Antoine Lavoisier where we've kind of went from alchemy to modern chemistry, disproving those five elements that Aristotle came up with that they don't actually exist, but there are elements that do exist. They're just different ones. Okay. So Antoine Lavoisier, huge, huge important scientist for changing uh, chemistry from alchemy here. Discovered a lot of important things. So the conservation of mass that he came up with, this idea is that stuff remains stuff. So if I were to take a match and I were to burn it, it would turn into ash and carbon dioxide and other things. Um, but if I am able to collect all of the material it turned into, including the smoke and the carbon dioxide and the things that float off into the air, and seal it in that container, it would actually weigh exactly the same before as after. Nothing would change in terms of the mass. Stuff remains stuff, and we don't lose any. We don't destroy any. Okay? So the law of conservation of mass is that mass cannot be created. It cannot be destroyed during a change. It can only be rearranged. So the match turns into smoke and carbon dioxide, but the smoke and carbon dioxide still weigh the same as the match did that it came from. So, the way we think of this now, let's say we were going to make a product called hydrogen chloride gas. It's made out of hydrogen and chlorine. If I took 2 grams of hydrogen and 70.9 grams of chlorine and I combined them and I make this new product, 
They merge together and they become a new particle, a new substance, but that new substance would weigh the same as the materials that make it up. So it would weigh 72.9, the two things that made it up added together. So let me give you guys an example of how a problem like this would work. Methane, CH4, it burns with oxygen, that's O2, and produces carbon dioxide and H2O, water. If 32.0 grams of methane are burned, it will require 72.0 grams of oxygen. So what will be the mass of the carbon dioxide in the water that's produced? So what will be the mass of the products afterwards, if this is the mass of the things it took to create it? Well, it's just simple addition, okay? 32 grams plus 72.0 grams equals 104.0 grams. And since both those have one decimal, my answer also has one decimal. Another example, sodium chloride, it's formed by the reaction of sodium and chlorine gas. Now, if 45.98 grams of sodium combines with some chlorine gas, but since it's a gas, I didn't measure it, okay, but it forms 116.89 grams of sodium chloride, how much, what was the mass of that chlorine gas that was used in this reaction? Well, we know that all of that extra mass for the sodium chloride there to form that 116.89 grams, all of the extra came from the chlorine. 45.98 of it came from the sodium. So if we just do some simple subtraction here, 116.89 grams, that's the sodium and the chlorine compound together, subtract the sodium part, 45.98 grams, you get 70.91 grams. So it took 70.91 grams of chlorine in this reaction here. That's how much chlorine was actually used. Conservation of mass, it had to come from somewhere. Now when we talk about uh, changing things, there are two types of changes. There's physical changes and there's chemical changes. A physical change is a change which does not alter the composition. So it's going to be the same substance that it was before the change. There's going to be no chemical bonds broken, no new chemical bonds are going to be formed. A couple of examples of a physical change, tearing, crushing, bending, okay? Anything in which you alter it but do not change what it is, that is a physical change. This also includes phase changes, like if you freeze something or if you melt it. It's still the same thing afterwards, but it's different in a way, all right? Now, this is uh, what a lot of manufacturing processes deal with. I mean, they, they take a sheet of metal, they cut it into pieces, they form it into other things, but it's still the same material you started with. So it's all physical changes. Chemical changes, on the other hand, chemical changes, this is when you actually get a new material. It's a change in composition. So when new substance is created out of the original substances, chemical bonds are either being broken or new chemical bonds are being formed. Uh, examples of this, combustion, where you burn something and it turns into carbon dioxide, water, smoke, a few other things, new materials. Rusting, iron and oxygen are turning into iron oxide, which is this red material. Corrosion, tarnishing, formation of a precipitate, when you get something that was a liquid that kind of suddenly forms a solid there, that's what a precipitate is, that would be a chemical change, okay, as it creates that new solid from a couple of liquids. So any chemical change, new material. Pan balance is a veteran monitor of change. Flame and smoke carry away substance from the charred matchsticks. The lightened pan rises. In some changes, weight is gained. The white powder is a drying agent that picks up water from the air to become a little heavier. The sensitive balance did not ignore it. The famous Alka-Seltzer fizz departs invisibly. The bubbles escape. The sample becomes lighter.
one modification only. Tighten the cap to keep the bubbles in. Now nothing can escape or enter, and the weight does not change. We are on the track of an unchanging quantity. Okay, seal her up. Let's put the top on it. We may not have totally perfected the electrically lit candle, but we're working on it real hard. Okay, Tom, let's put them on. Uh, it'll take more. It's we balance clear. the box on an antique farm scale. Now for the fine weights. Okay, try some of those off. Getting close, anyway. Yeah. Let me deliberately put some here to see if, how well we're doing. I'm putting two coins. I'd say we balance it to about one quarter. When I figure that out, that's better than a part in a thousand for the whole weight. OK, we have a good seal. We have a balance. Let's start it up. You want to move away the stools, and I'll turn the master switch. I will trigger by moving magnet A so that ball B can fall upon mousetrap C, I hope. But for the rest, you must watch for yourself. Aha, a glow. Motion, a candle, pop, sparklers. Oh, that's beautiful. The wind coupled fan. Popcorn. The barrage begins. Plenty of change. Firecrackers. And still it glows. The cube of smoke is good evidence that this box is pretty tightly sealed. The balance is well retained. All the changes we saw, from the steam expanded popcorn, to this charging storage battery, to the fan that drives the pinwheel, to the motions of the little toys and the expansion of the springs, to the explosion of the firecrackers, and the glow of the sparkler, all those chemical reactions, nothing changed in the balance. Weight. That which we measure on the balance remains constant during many changes. That's what we've shown here in a rowdy version of an elegant experiment that's been done repeatedly with great care ever since the 18th century and remains a pillar of science today. Now I want to talk about another uh, chemist who lived around the same time as Antoine Lavoisier, Joseph Proust. Joseph Proust was a French chemist. He's best known for his discovery of the law of definite proportions, sometimes called Proust's law in 1794, which is stating that chemical compounds always combine in constant proportion. So I want to talk about that law here. The law of definite proportions, Proust's law. Okay, if I have water, which we know is H2O, okay, what that means is that the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen in this substance is always 2 to 1. We always have twice as much hydrogen as oxygen in this material. Even though it's made out of those two, it is a set ratio. That's the law of definite proportions. Proportions is another word for ratio. Okay. What this means is that the water molecule has two atoms of hydrogen for every one atom of oxygen. 
Okay, so law of definite proportions. Atoms combine in definite ratios when forming these compounds. Thus, the ratio of those masses in the compound are also fixed. So we can actually use the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen, find out how much of it's hydrogen, how much of it's oxygen, and we can tell it is um, this percent hydrogen always for water. So we can actually tell something is water and not something else. There's actually more than one compound that is hydrogen and oxygen and nothing else, but the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen makes H2O water. Okay, if it's a different ratio, it's going to be a different substance. So if we actually were to measure the um, amount of hydrogen and oxygen in the water, we could do what's called percent by mass. All right, percent by mass is when you take the mass of the element in the compound and divide it by the mass of the entire compound times it by 100. For example, um, aspirin. Aspirin contains 80.7 grams of carbon, 47.77 grams of oxygen, and 6.03 grams of hydrogen. There's only three elements in aspirin. Find the percent by mass of carbon in this sample. Well, first I need to know what the mass of the compound is. And it's made out of these three elements, but law of conservation of mass here. I want to know the whole compound that it makes. All you got to do is add them up. So the mass of the compound, add up all three, and you get that it is 134.50 grams. Okay, so there's the mass of the compound. Now the part of it that is carbon is 80.70 grams. So to figure out the percent of it that's carbon, I'm going to take 80.70 grams, divide it by the whole mass of the compound, 134.50 grams, times that by 100, because it's a percentage, and I find that it's 60.00% carbon. Okay, That has four significant figures because of the 80.70 has four significant figures. Now, all aspirin is 60% carbon. If I measure something, let's say I take some sort of pill and I want to know what it is, and I actually throw it into a machine and it spits out that it is 61% carbon, that pill is not aspirin. It is not. Aspirin has to be, that chemical formula for it, has to be 60% carbon. Exactly. Now there's something also called the law of multiple proportions. If there are two elements that form a compound and then there's another compound made of those same two elements, right? So two elements that form more than one compound. The ratios of the masses of the second element, which combine with a fixed mass of the first element, will always be ratios of small whole numbers. That is a lot of words. Let me kind of break it down for you. So let's say we have two compounds. They're both made out of chlorine and copper. Okay? But these compounds are not the same. They're not the same material. All right? So chlorine and copper, but different amounts of chlorine and copper, okay? If I compare these to each other by making sure that I get a sample that has 50 grams of copper in both, you can clearly see that it is different amounts of chlorine, so it's going to be different amounts of um, chlorine compared to copper. So it's the same amount of copper in both of these um, compounds here, but different amounts of chlorine, so it's a different ratio of chlorine to copper. Okay, now a funny thing happened. Law of multiple proportions here. I'm going to kind of try to explain this here. If I were to compare the chlorines, they are exactly, one of them is double the other. 55.8 is exactly 27, or double 27.9. Okay, so if I have the equal amounts of copper there and compare the chlorines, it's exactly double. And this happens for almost all of the compounds that we can find where they're the same elements, okay, but different amounts of things in there. If you can get one of those elements, a sample, to be the same as the element in the other one, then the other one's going to be exactly double or exactly triple. It will always be a whole number. This shows us that the elements are combining in very discrete amounts, okay? Specifically, the first compound is one atom of copper, one atom of chlorine, and the second one is one atom of copper, two atoms of chlorine. It has exactly double the amount of chlorine because it is each one of them has two atoms of that chlorine. It doubles it. It shows atoms are these discrete pieces that get added in pieces here. 
proving that you don't have to be rich to get a law at least temporarily named after you, French pharmacist Joseph Proust built on Lavoisier's ideas of extremely careful measurement, showing that a chemical compound always contains the same proportions of elements. For a while we called this Proust's Law, but to make it easier to remember for the world, we just call it the Law of Definite Proportions now. And then an English school teacher, John Dalton, followed Proust by examining what at first appeared to be a problem with Proust's work. Carbon and oxygen, when reacted together, would form two different proportions, not just one. Of course, what was happening is obvious to us. Carbon and oxygen were reacting to form two different compounds, carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. As Dalton's work continued, he found something truly mind-bendingly fascinating. If you limited the amount of carbon reacting to exactly one gram, the mass of oxygen consumed to produce one compound was 1.33 grams, while the mass consumed to produce the other compound was 2.66, exactly double what was required for the other compound. This shook out for other reactions, too. When reacting nitrogen and oxygen, and limiting to exactly one gram of nitrogen, three compounds formed. One compound consumed 1.750 grams of oxygen, another consumed 0.8750 grams, and another consumed 0.4374 grams. All of those numbers are relatable by small whole number ratios. Oxygen wasn't reacting with some ephemeral cloud of the idea of nitrogen. It was reacting with individual discrete bits of nitrogen that couldn't be divided. It could react in a number of ways, but it was always the same oxygen and the same nitrogen with the same properties. And so while in our first episode we showed you how Einstein actually proved that atoms exist with super fancy math, Dalton had used multiplication to become the first person to actually have real data supporting the idea of atoms. So John Dalton is the one who kind of combined all of this work about law of definite proportions and law of multiple proportions and law of conservation mass from Lavoisier, Priestley, Proust, a whole bunch of others came up with an explanation for all of this. His explanation is called the atomic theory. Okay, so the atomic theory, the original, which he came up with in the 1800s, has four parts. Part one, all matter is made up of these particles called atoms. That comes from Democritus, okay? All atoms of a given element are identical, okay? That comes from Aristotle, the idea of elements making up things, okay? Atoms cannot be created or destroyed or divided. That comes from Lavoisier. And atoms combine in simple whole number ratios to form compounds. They can be rearranged in chemical reactions to make new compounds. This comes from Proust's law and from the work that Dalton did with the multiple and definite proportions. So Dalton's atomic theory, four pieces to it that basically says stuff is made out of atoms and these are what they are. So Dalton's idea of what this atom looked like, he called it a model like because you can't actually see them. So he made models of it, like your pictures of it, so you can kind of imagine them. He imagined atoms as little balls, little spheres, okay? Um, and these balls or these spheres could combine together to make compounds. They combine, make a compound, those words are related. Um, and once you get a compound that's a new substance made of those original atoms, and you can basically combine them in infinite ways to make all the substances in the universe. But there's only specific atoms, specific types, which we call elements, that can combine to make them. And those are what we have on the periodic table. There's 118 that we've discovered so far, and don't think we've discovered them all. They think there might be up to uh, at least 120, but they still haven't found the last two that they think might exist, and we're not sure if there might even be more than that. So, so let's talk about uh, pure substances. A pure substance means that we have a material which only has one type of substance in it. That might be an element, it might be a compound, but if it's pure, there's only that there. So an element, if we talk about a pure element, that means we have a material that is only one kind of atom. Elements are basically the kinds of atoms. For example, copper, gold, oxygen, okay? If we have pure copper, pure element of copper, we have something that just has copper atoms in it. One type. Kind of looks like this, just the same atom over and over again. A compound, on the other hand, we have more than one type of atom bonded together to make a new substance. For example, water, H2O, oxygen, and hydrogen bonded together to make a little water molecule. Um, 
But if it's pure, a pure compound, I want to be specific here, that means that it's only water molecules. So we have an H2O, and then another H2O, and then another H2O, and then another H2O, and all of those molecules are individually bonded together and made out of two elements, but you only have one type of molecule. It's always the same, two hydrogens and an oxygen bonded together. So that whole thing there is a pure compound. You could also have pure table salt, which would be NaCl bonded together, or pure sugar, which would be C12, H22, O11 bonded to make a big old molecule. But if you only had that molecule, it's a pure compound. Okay, now pure things can look, there's a few different pictures that I might show you here. Here's another version of a pure element. So oxygen here will actually bond, like two atoms will bond together. They're the same type though. So you have two bonded together and then another two bonded together and then another two bonded together. That's still considered an element because there's only one type there. Only one kind of atom in that, that group, even though it's groups of two of them. You can also have compounds where this would be NaCl here, where you have an Na and a Cl that are bonded together, but they're so close that you can't really tell the next one from the next one, so they just kind of form this repeating pattern there. So that's another kind of structure we're going to talk about when we get to ions. Now, separating compounds. This would be a chemical change, taking a compound and breaking it into its elements. This is something we didn't discover until the late 1800s when we basically discovered how to make electricity because the way you do it is through a process called electrolysis. So electrolysis is a technique used to separate a compound chemically, it's a chemical change, using an electric current. You provide enough electricity, enough voltage, and essentially you can take any compound and rip it into its elements. Right? Here's an example with separating water into hydrogen and oxygen. Let us try to take a well-known material and break it into its elementary constituents. We can sort water into two substances with an electrical current. The current enters the base of one tube and leaves by the other. Tiny bubbles form and rise within each tube to sum up into a noticeable space. Hydrogen on the left, oxygen on the right. Note the proportions of the two gas volumes. Before our eyes, the famous formula is realized. Two volumes of hydrogen to one of oxygen, H2O. Something internal must be behind this simplicity. We did nothing to build in a simple ratio. Let's try the reverse, combining the two elements. The steel cylinders hold commercial hydrogen and oxygen. We put equal amounts of each gas into a single strong glass tube. That's the hydrogen. It displaces some of the water that was in the tube. Two units. Now for the oxygen. The gases combine when triggered by an electrical spark. Watch again in slow motion. None of the gas escapes from the bottom of the tube. The newly made water just joins what was there. But there is something left over. There is always something left over. We tried all afternoon to change that result. But the gases were stubborn. Two hydrogens can take up one oxygen, but no more. One oxygen is left over. Something deep within water appears to know a little arithmetic. I do not claim there is only one way to explain so simple a result. But if there are atoms, and if within water they do cling into little clusters of the right type, that would explain everything very neatly. H2O.
So we talked about pure things. Let's talk about mixtures now. A mixture is essentially when you have two substances that are mixed together, but they're not bonded. They're just mixed. You still have those two substances. Now, there's two types of mixtures, heterogeneous and homogeneous. Heterogeneous means that it is not the same throughout. Okay, so um, I have multiple substances mixed together, but they're not mixed very well. A good example of this would be pizza. Okay, if you have one slice of pizza and it's got like, say, pepperoni on it, one slice might have more pepperoni than other slices because it's not very evenly spread throughout the mixture. Um, and so different samples, different pieces will yield different ratios of cheese and pepperoni and sauce and things like that. Um, another good example would be uh, Italian salad dressing. You can see little chunks floating around in there. Uh, oil and water don't mix very well, so sometimes it separates and you kind of have to pour off the a little bit of oil and you're left with a whole bunch of water there. That's why a lot of times you shake things. M&Ms are a good example of a heterogeneous mixture. It's just not evenly mixed. You might actually get a chunk with a whole bunch of one part of the mixture and not a lot of the other. Now, a homogeneous mixture, on the other hand, that is when you have two substances that are so well mixed, it is almost perfectly evenly spread throughout the entire thing. And so if you get a different sample of it, you're probably still going to get the exact same ratio. Uh, one good example of this is salt water. Okay, Salt and water. They are a mixture of two substances. So they're not pure. It's not pure water. It's not pure salt. It is salt and water mixed together. But they're so well mixed that you can't really tell one from the other. Okay, It's basically like perfectly evenly spread throughout each other and really well mixed. And a lot of times we just think of it as one thing, but it's not. It's two things well mixed together. Pops another one. You got sugar and flavoring mixed with water and carbon dioxide. Gatorade. You can even have something solid. Brass is a homogeneous mixture of zinc and copper mixed so well that we actually gave it a new name, brass, but it is actually two different things just mixed together. Okay. Now, a lot of people sometimes get mixtures mixed up with compounds, so I've got a little video here trying to explain the difference between what makes something a mixture and what makes something a compound, all right? In this experiment, we will first make a mixture of black iron filings and yellow sulfur powder. Black iron filings and yellow sulfur powder are thoroughly mixed. They form a gray mixture of the two elements. This mixture can be separated by physical methods. For example, when a magnet is brought to the mixture, it removes essentially all the iron filings, leaving the sulfur behind, which here looks gray because of the impurities from the iron. The iron has been separated from the sulfur by means of a magnet. When the same mixture is heated in a test tube, the two elements, iron and sulfur, react together to form a new compound, iron sulfide. At first, when the mixture is heated, the sulfur melts. Eventually, as the heating continues, the iron and sulfur begin to react together. When the Bunsen is removed, the tube continues to glow as the reaction proceeds. The gray-black brittle solid formed is a new compound, iron sulfide. It is unlike either sulfur or iron and cannot be separated by a magnet. So because mixtures are more than one material, it is actually possible to separate it through physical changes, not chemical changes, because there's still those things, you're still going to have those things, 
but physical changes separating the mixtures into its components, into its thing, trying to make them pure. This is a big part of what a lot of chemists do. They try to separate things and get pure things because a lot of times in nature they're calm, pre-mixed. Now in order to decide what is the best technique for separating a mixture, you want to think about the properties of the things that are there. Okay, so you have to find a property that the two things do not share in that mixture. So one of the properties that they don't share, that can be used to separate them. For example, the first one here is filtration. Filtration is a technique which uses a porous barrier, basically a filter, to separate a solid from a liquid. The physical property here that you're using is the fact that one's a solid and one's a liquid. Um, and essentially you can just use a filter to separate them. So sand and water is solid and mixed with a liquid. Pour it through a filter in a funnel, the water is going to go right through. But the sand will not, it'll get caught in that filter and so you'll be able to separate them. You're exploiting the fact that there are different states of matter here. A different technique that you can use is uh, distillation. Now this one is used for two liquids essentially and in this case that property is the same. You don't want to use the fact that they're liquid and solid because they're both liquids. So you have to exploit a different property. In this case with distillation you're exploiting their boiling points. So boiling points of the substances are different and what you do is you basically boil them but you boil them at a lower temperature so whatever the boiling point of the lower one is it will start to boil while the other one does not boil. And so you boil it off, and you can actually, this is called a distillation setup, whatever liquid boils first at a lower temperature, you boil it off and it rises up and then kind of goes down this condenser, which cools it again and turns it back into a liquid. So you can actually collect that first liquid, which boils at a lower temperature, um, right here. And then what will be left in here is whatever boils at a higher temperature after a little while. Okay, so this is used a lot for separating alcohol and water. So if you had like a mixture, when they make alcohol, it's usually mixed with a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but then they just want to get just the alcohol. So they will boil off the alcohol because it has a lower boiling point than most of the things it's mixed with. And so it goes up here and they cool it off and they collect the alcohol down here. And they can use it for adding into gasoline and things like that. The crystallization. The ex property you're exploiting here is when you have a, a liquid and something is dissolved in it and you actually turn one of those things into a solid and then you can kind of just get that solid out by like filtration or even just kind of pull it out. So crystallization, you have this liquid mixture and you are able to separate them. Usually this uh, focuses on freezing point. So if I have two liquids mixed together and they have a different freezing point, if I cool them down to the freezing point of one of them but not the other, one of them will freeze turn into a solid, the other one will not, and then you can just kind of filter it out. And this is called crystallation. Chromatography is another way to uh, separate things. So this is when you have things that do not move the same in a liquid. So if I have, for example, two colors of ink that are mixed together to make a different color, but I want to separate them, um, I can actually basically put them on, say, some sort of like filter and stick it in some water and the water will kind of wick up that filter but it will actually attract the two different types of inks at different rates so it will actually pull up one of those inks faster than the other and so it actually causes them to separate right so you're using the fact that they are attracted to some liquid whatever that liquid might be against them to separate them and that's it those are the ones i have for you